In this lecture, I describe environmental health, which encompasses the health of the environment itself, um, how much it's polluted or contaminated, and also the health of the populations of organisms that um, are supported by the environment, including human populations and some diseases that relate to environmental contamination, as well as um, animal populations too. And then lastly, we'll go into a certain and specific environmental toxins, their effects, and some of the um, causes of mutations and cancers that relate to these toxins. A general definition of health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of physical disease or illness. Um, there could be more things added to that definition as well. That's our basic definition um, for this lecture and talking about environmental health. A disease is an abnormal change in the body's condition that impairs important physical or psychological functions. Environmental health focuses on environmental factors that cause disease and disorder in humans and in other non-human organisms as well. One metric that well represents the environmental health is childhood survival or childhood mortality. You can see here from these maps that the infant or child mortality rate has drastically decreased across the globe um, in the last 125 or so years, especially in um, North America and Europe and um, Russia as well but it's dropped all over the world and much lower rates due to a lot of health care and things like that. But why is childhood uh, survival or mortality rate a good indicator of environmental health? Well, it has a lot to do with access uh, for people to clean water, uh, air, good food, medicines, and the uh, availability of those things has increased drastically in the last hundred or so years. However, child mortality rates have dropped throughout the world, but they're not the same everywhere and for every different um, ethnic group. Here we're looking at the inequities of child mortality um, by race and ethnicity, and just in the United States, and we see it's much higher for American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and than it is for whites, or Hispanics is much higher, same with blacks as it is for Asians or whites. So that directly reflects classism and the, the privilege that comes with the general wealth from white and sometimes Asian cultures um, is that there's more access to healthy water, healthy foods, living in healthy, uncontaminated environments and access to health care. What's a definition of a pathogen? It's any organism or agent that can produce disease. So a pathogen may be also referred to as an infect infectious agent or a germ, but they are living things, except in the case of viruses and prions, which are considered not living, but they are something that reproduces and transmits diseases. So, so those also be contained in the pathogen category. Chronic diseases are ones that are persistent and otherwise long-lasting in their effects, or a disease that comes on slowly over time. That phrase chronic is applied when the course of the disease lasts for more than three months. So you can get something and then if it lasts, like uh, you could get a cold or a sinus infection, and if it lasts longer, it turns into bronchitis or sinusitis which is more of a chronic disease. It starts out not chronic and becomes chronic. Um, some examples are heart disease, um, stroke, cancer, obesity, arthritis. These are accumulative diseases that progress. An emergent disease is something that may have been around in the background, but it's a new type of disease. It's newly recognized in a population. Um, it, or it could have existed, but it rapidly increases in incidence or range. So 
um, COVID-19 was an emergent disease that came from the animal kingdom, but it got into the human kingdom or the human uh, population and um, expanded rapidly. That, that was definitely a good example of an emergent disease. Malaria is a great example of a disease in humanity that has an uh, interesting history. It's been greatly reduced um, in its um, infection rates throughout the world. Um, for the most part, eradicated in North America. Uh, you can see from the map that historically the distribution of malaria was fairly widespread in the Midwest, South and East coast until about 1900 and slowly it kind of got uh, eradicated moving southward. Um, there are some new cases that have been popping up in the United States which is bringing some more discussion to that and possibly um, if there could be a vaccination is what's being talked about right now in um, 2024. Um, but you can still see that there are still plenty of deaths to malaria, more in developing and also equatorial countries where it's moist and tropical. There's a lot of standing water where the larvae breed um, and maybe less um, access to housing that can have netting or screens and prevent the, the mosquitoes from passing on that disease by um, biting people at night. The Ebola outbreak, that particular disease that um, got into the human population in West Africa in 2014, was a scary one at the time um, as far as diseases go because it got into the human population. It was likely a virus that was normal in a wild chimp and those chimp chimpanzees or monkeys, those populations, they had it but it didn't affect them. But once it got transferred into humans, probably from humans eating that the meat, it's called bush meat of wild animals, then it got into humans and it mutated into this form that caused a real disease in humans and spread very quickly. The Ebola virus also got into um, it got into the gorilla population in West Africa and about a third of the gorilla population has been killed to date by the Ebola virus and that was partly its outbreak from chimpanzees and, and or monkeys and getting into other populations, gorillas and humans. White nose syndrome is a disease caused by a fungus that got into the bat population a couple of decades ago and has caused the death of millions of bats in eastern North America. Amphibians are being affected by a disease called the chytrid disease and that is a fungal disease that affects many amphibians especially because the dispersal of the fungal spores occurs in water where amphibians live at least um, a, a big chunk of their life. Um, this is an example of a disease that is related to environmental health too because as the amphibian's habitat is compromised through water contamination, sedimentation, also habitat fragmentation and habitat loss, the amphib amphibian's populations which are already a sensitive organism because they take in so much through their skin, um, they are even at greater risk now due to this disease which has spread pretty widely. What about diseases and climate change? Um, climate change is helping the expansion of lots of parasites and diseases because areas that were that usually had a colder season and a lot of parasites like ticks, mosquitoes, fleas would um, die off during the snowy or frozen cold season. Now some of those areas are getting warmer and they don't have a dormant season as much anymore. So these tropical diseases proliferate in the warm moist climates and are found, finding new areas to expand into. And analogous to super weeds are super bugs. These are pathogens, bacteria, fungi, otherwise as you know all, what a pathogen is now, 
other microscopic organisms, but they're resistant to the standard antibiotics used to treat infections because we've used so many of them. It, in a sense, has selected for uh, resistant strains of those pathogens, and now we've developed these bugs that are that do not respond to our antibiotics, and we don't have anything else we know to be able to fight them. Here is a definition of environmental toxin. They are made um, by human processes and there's some type of substance that damages humans and other living organisms. Toxicology is the study of those substances and their effects on organisms. Environmental toxins can enter the human body through the air that we breathe, going into our respiratory system, our lungs, and thus our bloodstream. The food we eat also getting into our bloodstream, the water we drink, personal care products we use, they all can get into our blood and move all around our body and cause problems with different tissues. Here are the definitions of two different types of toxin exposure, acute or chronic. Some of these environmental toxic substances can dissolve in water and some not in water but only in fat. And the fat soluble toxins are particularly dangerous in the sense that in an organism's body, they can accumulate inside fatty tissues and become more concentrated than even the dose that the, the organism was exposed to. And they can accumulate up to a level that even though the exposure wasn't toxic, the levels that they concentrate into in the fatty tissue can become higher and become uh, up to a, a toxic level and then cause damage. That process by which these fat soluble toxins accumulate inside of a biological organism is called bioaccumulation. It's storage of that chemical in the body tissue or organ. In this case the, the fat soluble ones would be in fatty tissues. The bioaccumulation takes place in an organism over usually the span of its whole life resulting in a higher and higher concentration as that organism gets older. Biomagnification takes place as chemicals transfer from lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels. So say if a fish was exposed to a PCB in the ocean and it got some into its fatty tissues and over the, its lifespan uh, accumulates more and more of that PCBs and they get to a higher concentration, that's bioaccumulation and that could affect that fish, that individual fish. But then when humans or something like a bald eagle or other sharks eat that fish, now they're getting high concentrations from that and they eat a lot of that fish, then they're going to biomagnify the concentrations of that toxin and it very likely will cause a negative effect in that organism that eats it. Another phenomena to consider is the chemical interactions of different toxins. You, let's say you have toxin A and toxic B in a water source um, or in the soil. There could, they, those two toxins can have an additive effect being A, a certain amount of effect affects the performance of that organism, B affects it a certain amount, and A and B together both present in that soil, those would um, have a an effect that was additive. This, the amount of effect of A and B just summed. An antagonistic effect of those two environmental toxins both present could reduce the overall effect in associated organisms. That's antagonistic, kind of one toxin fights the other. Synergistic is both of those toxins together could cause a much more than a, an additive effect. It can cause an effect that's greater than the effect of both of those two singly. So that's what synergistic is. The toxics release inventory created by the EPA is a way for you to find out about um, what's happening regarding environmental toxins in your local area. Um, you can learn about chemical releases and pollution prevention activities that are reported by the industry, industrial companies and by federal facilities. So look for that if you're coming to a new area to live. Um, it's important for you to know about it for your health. 
Allergens can be considered toxic substances. Obviously not pollen, unless sometimes pollen is from an invasive species. It's foreign. Um, that can happen too, but dust, human-made allergens, um, soot, smog, they're foreign substances that are in the air. They're unnatural and they affect humans through their respiratory system. Your body has a response. It produces antibodies that are made to defend against these foreign substances and those fight those off, except they can also call, cause the anti-antibody um, or antihistamine response and it can cause kind of a cascade of problems in humans, these allergens, and other organisms too. So what is meant by the saying that dose makes the poison? This is a, um, a known dynamic that's been around for a long time. It, what it means is there's plenty of foods that are fine to ingest and they have low levels of uh, environmental toxins or toxic substances naturally in them. Um, like plants in the tomato family or potato, same family. Um, they have solanin and that is toxic at a certain level. Um, there's formaldehyde that's produced in things like pears, um, amygdalin in apples, cucurbitin in squashes. Those all are toxic for humans, but not at a low level. So at a certain level, they become toxic. Take, for example, um, common milkweed. Um, most people know that this is a toxic plant. You shouldn't eat it. Um, some call it poisonous. Um, we know that monarch caterpillars are able to uh, ingest the leaves of the milkweed and they take those toxins, which are called cardiac glycosides, and they um, compartmentalize them in their bodies so they're not just flowing around damaging it. it. It keeps them in special areas that it doesn't hurt the rest of the caterpillar. And then they also are using that as defense so they are so birds um, know and learn that they are toxic to eat these caterpillars because of the toxins they've gotten from the milkweed. But meanwhile, like some of my research and work that I've done with um, native peoples in the Midwest, they eat the milkweed, um, cook it like asparagus, the young shoots, and eat it. Um, so is it really toxic? Well, they prepare it and cook it until the toxins are mostly cooked out of it. So a little bit of the toxins actually, by a lot of these native peoples, is thought to be beneficial. The cardiac glycosides um, make your heart pump faster. A little bit is kind of like a stimulant, can kind of get, it, get you up and going. A lot could make you have a heart attack. So a little bit is beneficial, a lot is basically toxic. And similar to the milkweed example, what about caffeine itself? Caffeine's great, it's a stimulant, it's fun, makes you feel good, not necessarily bad for you at low and moderate levels, but it also can be fatal and be a poison if taken, too much is taken in. Here it's saying a single shot of espresso has 64, about 64 milligrams of caffeine, but a toxic dose would be like 78 shots and that would kill you. So um, gosh, that's a lot. Let's talk about a few examples of environmental toxins that do bioaccumulate in um, sea organisms and also moving up and biomagnify in humans by humans ingesting those sea creatures. PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls are highly carcinogenic. They're chemical compounds that are used or were used in industrial and consumer products and product production. They were banned in 1976 by the Toxic Substances Control Act when we found out how, how damaging they were um, and by the International Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. And that was back in 2001. So the primary route of exposure of PCBs to most people is through foods, uh, particularly fish and poultry, where the, this fat soluble chemical bioaccumulates in those organisms. Then when humans eat it, they biomagnify. These toxins are stored in the fatty tissues and accumulate there, and that's where they cause damage too. Sadly, these PCBs are very persistent in 
um, the environment once they get out there and they can travel all over the world through uh, ocean currents and some atmospheric too. A study was done of uh, Quebec women, mostly um, remote um, Inuit people and women, and they found the PCBs in their breast milk. And these are these people are nowhere near where these um, PCBs are produced um, or even used much. So they are they have traveled and spread all over the place and concentrated in the fatty tissue of whales and things that are eaten by the Inuit people. Neurotoxins are another category of environmental toxins that affect normal functioning of human nervous systems and also other organisms' nervous systems. Um, things like heavy metals, like lead, can kill the nerve cells directly. Um, DDT is something that can disrupt nerve cell membranes. Organophosphates inhibit signal transmission between the cells, tissues, organs, and muscles. PCBs are one of those. Mutagens are chemicals, agents that damage or alter the genetic material, the DNA, that can lead to birth defects or later in life tumor growth. Um, they can, it doesn't have to be just a chemical, it could be something like radiation from the sun. Um, so infectious agents, chemicals, radiation can all cause DNA to be altered and sometimes damaged to um, an extent that it affects the functioning of that organism and sometimes it makes cells start to divide in a crazy rate and that would be the kind that produce tumors. A common one is called um, teratogen and that causes ab abnormalities in the embryonic development of organisms like alcohol overabundance of alcohol in the bloodstream can damage DNA and cause fetal alcohol syndrome in unborn children. As you probably know, hormones are made by your body to regulate the development of your body and the function of tissues and organs and a way your parts of one part of your body can communicate with the other, different organs can kind of regulate each other. Um, but these hormones and the production of them can be disrupted by chemicals like DDT or PCBs, other um, environmental toxins and interfere with, your, with yours or any organisms functioning. Persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, um, like I said, can cause problems and they can hang out in the environment for a long, long time. Dicamba is a current ingredient in some weed killing um, herbicides and it's highly soluble in water, making it extremely mobile in the soil and aquatic systems. So it can easily contaminate groundwater and it has a tendency to drift into nearby fields, damaging crops, the things that we don't want to kill with herbicides. Um, especially ones that aren't genetically engineered to be dicamba resistant, so it can damage neighbor non-target crops. Um, also, there's other pesticides that are like that too, and these are all have danger to um, non-target or target organisms and the soil and humans. One thing that's really interesting about these environmental toxins is how humans view them and their relative risk of them in general we tend to downplay risks that are related to things that we care about or like to do and exaggerate the risk of things that are you know we're not they're not related to us or what we like to do so um, if it's something that we do a lot let's say um, you like to swim in rivers a lot we tend to kind of brush off the fact that there might be some pollution in there or maybe jardia or um, some danger from rapids. People tend to downplay that. Meanwhile, they're exaggerating of risks that are not related, like, oh, what's happening in the ocean environment or in the air? So our perception of risk is important to think about too, and how we actually approach some of these risks of environmental toxins. I know my, for myself with some foods that I like, I don't really wanna think about the possibility of the toxins in them and I just wanna eat them. So that's kind of one way that I would downplay that of something I like. Whereas I might think like, oh, no one should have shellfish because they bioaccumulate PCBs. You know, I would maybe get more up in arms about that because I don't like shellfish. So it's just something to think about.